So we continue our study in the uh, Minor Prophets, and especially in the book of uh, Habakkuk tonight, uh, August 19th, uh, here in 2020. And as we go through the uh, introduction here to the book, uh, it was written really on the latter times, uh, latter, latter years of Josiah, and uh, really uh, the prophet's concern was the uh, spirituality of the people of the day and the fact that uh, Jehovah was, was very patient, and he was understanding of the fact, not understanding of the fact, that uh, Jehovah was very patient with the people. He thought that perhaps he could not go on any farther with the people of Israel as they were, were sinning. Now, this was most likely written on the eve of the captivity, and as a book, he raises the uh, concern of God's consistency with himself, as I said, in, in view of the uh, evil of the day and the fact that the prophet was uh, uh, not really understanding the holiness of God and how that could continue with the evilness that the, the land of Israel, the nation of Israel, was uh, participating in. So uh, Jehovah answers this question uh, concerning this, concerning the uh, Chaldean invasion in chapter 1, verse 6, and also the worldwide dispersion was, was going to happen. And as we think about uh, Jehovah, he's not just mere wrath all the time. He is the God who delights in mercy. So we're uh, so very thankful about that. Now, chapter 3, as we uh, conclude here uh, tonight and then the, the next uh, Wednesday night here, the, the, the title of this chapter is, is a prayer of uh, Habakkuk, the prophet. He composes it in the same manner of uh, the psalmist David as he uh, directs it to the, the uh, chief singer, the chief mu musician, if you will. The occasion of it is expressed in chapter 3, verse 2, in which the prophet uh, really declares the concern for the work of the Lord and the promotion of the kingdom of God uh, through the interest of the work of God as he observes the various steps uh, that were t taken uh, in advancement of this work. And uh, he suggests that the, uh, the manner of the, of the Lord's dealings, the people of Israel, uh, should be one where they... He is concerned about the settling them in the land of Canaan. So he is concerned about the work of God as a result, as it, as it, as it uh, applies to the nation of Israel in uh, chapter 3 in the book of Habakkuk. Now, several things were, were awful in this account. We call it awful. Things were not right in this account. Uh, the judgments of God that would be, would be coming, the conflicts of the trial of his own people, and this, this greatly affected him in his, in his mind and his heart as recorded here in verse 16 of chapter 3. Yet in, in, the, in the sense of the word, he, uh, he is encouraged, though, because as he comes to the end of this chapter, uh, his faith is strong because he understands that there is, there's better times to come. And most assuredly, uh, he is given this uh, uh, assurance here in verses 17 through 19. You know, as, as the graphic says, uh, storms don't last forever. And so even in the Christian life, we're glad that storms don't last forever. And we'll start off here, the book in chapter 3, verse 1, uh, a prayer of Habakkuk, uh, the prophet upon uh, Shigedoth. And so this is a prayer which Habakkuk, the, the prophet, prayed uh, when he was revealed unto him concerning the, the length of time of which God would give to the wicked people. Now, this was a confusing thing to the prophet. He, he, you know, he didn't understand the, the, the great patience of God, and so this was a, a concern and a confusing thing uh, to him. Uh, he would, they would return to the law uh, with a perfect heart, the, the children of Israel, and they should be forgiven of all their sins which they had committed before him. Now, in this prayer, he really uh, reminisces back through the history of the nation of Israel, and uh, he gives them some various, uh, in his prayer, he gives some various accounts of things that God had done uh, previously. Now, the phrase upon or according to Shigenoth, uh, which means a song. Now, this phrase is not, it's not exactly known uh, what, is, what it means. There are several, several possibilities. I'll show you, show you here on the screen. The word seems to be plural, the word Shigion. And it's the title of the, of the seventh psalm, Psalm 7, verse, verse 1. It was either the name, the title, or the first word of a song, or songs, plural, uh, according, to be, according to which it would be sung, or even the name of a tune, uh, which was to be sung, or even the name of an instrument, which was to be uh, sung upon or used. And so this word, uh, exactly not known uh, the meaning of it, so we have several accounts of what it could mean here in this verse. Now, verse 2 uh, he continues in this prayer. He says, O Lord, I've heard thy speech, and, and, I, and I, I was afraid. That speaks to the uh, words of the, uh, what God's instructions was given to him, uh, to the prophet, which made him fearful. We're not told specifically at this point uh, what he was uh, being told, but he says uh, what God told him made him afraid. And sometimes, you know, even in our life, 
uh, God brings us down a certain path. We're sort of fearful of what the, the path will, will entail. And so we're no different than the, the prophet here in this book. Uh, we have the same uh, feelings sometimes, same uh, uncertainties at times, and that's what this prophet was experiencing as he begins his prayer here in chapter 3. He says, O Lord, revive thy work in the midst of the years. He had witnessed, really, uh, the, the deterioration of the nation of Israel as the enemies of God were coming upon him, upon them, I should say. And he, he says, uh, in regard to the soon-to-be captivity, uh, he wanted God to revive his work in, in the midst of the years. Don't let the, the difficult times you know, hide the power and greatness of God. So his prayer is one of, of spirituality. He was not really praying for uh, wealth and health, if you will, but he was praying for God's intervention in their lives spiritually. It says, in the midst of the years, make known. Uh, make known your, your promises, uh, your, 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 your grace, your love, your mercy. All these things be revealed to, the, to God's people. Please do this. It's what he's trying to say here in this prayer. As we go here in verse 2, he says, In wrath, remember mercy. Uh, remember, uh, I said it was most likely written. Uh, these occasions took place on the, on the eve of the, of the uh, captivity. And so uh, this man, Habakkuk, he knew what was going to come as the children of Israel would be carried away over into Babylon. And so in times of judgment and great uh, uncertainty for God's people, uh, he, he pleads to God, you know, let your loving kindness and your tender mercies you know, smile on us again and, and comfort our souls, is what he's uh, saying here in this verse. Now, verse 3, as he continues in this prayer, uh, he reminisces, as I said, about some events that had taken place in previous years in the life of the children of Israel. He says, uh, God came from Teman, or li literally, may God come from Teman, was, as the prayer of, uh, of Habakkuk, signifying the place of the giving of, of the law to his people. God revealed uh, this from the city of Teman, a city in the south, many years before this time. So he's, he's reminiscing and saying, you know, when you showed us your power, Lord, please show us your power again. And the Holy One from Mount Paran, or even the Holy One as, uh, as that came or shined forth uh, from Mount Paran, uh, for it was Christ that then appeared on Mount Sinai, and it was given uh, of the law by Moses uh, on the same mountain. So he's reminiscing, going back into the history of the nation of Israel, and even forward in, in the time of Christ, uh, this is where it took place on Mount Sinai, where the Ten Commandments were given. So uh, he is reminiscing concerning uh, events that took place in the nation of Israel in previous years gone by, and also looking forward in prophecy uh, to the time that Christ appeared on, uh, on Mount Sinai. Then as we go on in the same verse, uh, it, he ends with this word, Selah. Now oftentimes you see this in other portions of the Scripture, especially in, in the Psalms. It stands here in the middle, middle of this verse. It's interpreted by several Jewish writers as forever or truly, truly, or very truly, or even amen. Some understand it to be a pause or a full stop, denoting attention uh, to something that was said or that is remarkable. And others take it to be a note directing the singer to the uh, elevation of his voice, and perhaps the, you know, uh, raising his voice or lowering his voice, the word selah. As you see in the graphic, it means pause and listen. Uh, one, one preacher said, yeah, sort of like the, uh, the uh, commercial on TV, uh, the pause that refreshes. And so uh, there's the word Selah. And then we go here to this uh, next section of the verse. His glory covered the heavens. Now, this was uh, concerning the, his first coming, as it will be so uh, understandable and remarkable at his second coming and during the 1,000-year reign of Christ. As Jesus Christ came, uh, he co covered the glory of the, of the heavens. You know, his glory covered the, the heavens. And then the earth was full of, of praise. As we think about the, the birth of Christ, certainly there was uh, the angels praised uh, the Lord, you know, the, the shepherds praised the Lord, and so it was evidence that Christ's first coming as a babe in the manger, and more fully will it be realized at his second coming as King of kings and Lord of lords. So again, he's reminiscing on some things that took place in previous years, and also uh, looking forward to prophecy that will take place in the years to come. We're going to verse 4 now, it says, And his brightness was as the light. As we're breaking these verses down uh, section by section, this uh, prophetic statement refers to Christ as being the light of the world and the son of righteousness, describes him really in the brightness of his father's glory and as the only begotten of the father, seen of his own disciples in the days of his flesh when he came uh, as, uh, as the, the Messiah and then shining through his works and miracles and they exhibited in the light of his glorious gospel. So again, he is looking forward to uh, things that would still yet be a future even in his life as we think about prophecy. 
Then he had horns coming out of his hand. He, he reverts back here to some things that took place in, in, uh, in previous years of, even of his life. Jewish interpreters understand this to refer to Moses having the horns or beams of light and glory uh, from the hand of the hand and power of God when he, was, when he conversed with him on the mount and the skin of his face shined. Uh, so we think about Moses being on, on Mount Sinai and as he came down, his face, you know, his, the Bible says his face uh, shine or did shine. And it says, and there was, there was, uh, and there was hiding of his power. As you think about this, uh, in his hand there, there, was, there was his power, which was before hidden and was now made manifest. And set, so little of it was displayed, though, even in Moses' life and in comparison to what it really was. You know, there was Moses, he was on Mount Sinai. He, he saw uh, the power of God. And when he came down, the people knew that he had been uh, there and uh, his countenance was changed. So uh, again, Habakkuk is referring back to an incident that had taken place even before uh, he came on the scene. Now on to verse 5, it says, Before him went a pestilence. He is thinking here about the land of Egypt. When he marched through that land and, 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 and uh, through all the firstborn, as it records for us in Psalm 78, verse 50 and 51, and before the other diseases and judgments, and they destroyed, and, and they were destroyed, you know, uh, uh, along the way uh, to make make room, room for his people, the children of Israel. So again, referring back to uh, Moses when he led ch the children of Israel out of Egypt. That says, and the burning coals went forth at his feet. This be understood of the hailstones mingled with fire during the plagues of Egypt, as recorded for us in Exodus 9, verse 23 and verse 24. So uh, this prayer, he is really reminding God what he had done in previous years and the power that he had displayed in previous years. And on the eve of this captivity, perhaps he's just pleading to God to show them the, his power again. Verse 6 says, he stood and measured the earth. And so, you know, as you think about the, our prayer life, we sometimes in our prayer life, we say, Lord, you know, you did this for Moses. You did this for uh, Peter. You just did this for David. You know, please show us your power. So this perhaps is the spirit that uh, Habakkuk is praying. This alludes to the, the Ark of the Lord, the symbol of his presence, standing and abiding at Gilgal for the space of 14 years while the land of Canaan was subdued by Joshua and then measured out by him and divided by Lot and as an inheritance to the children of Israel and according to the direction and appointment of the Lord as recorded for us in Joshua 13, verses 1 through 33. Again, referring back to things that happened before him and reminding God of his great power. It says, he beheld and drove asunder the nations. He drove the Canaanites you know, out of the land and separated them from one another and scattered them to make room for his people. Again, in, from Psalm 78, verse 55. Psalm 78 has a, a, a great uh, review of the uh, incidents that took place in the lives of the children of Israel and in, in their nation and of what God did in his great and mighty power uh, for them and toward them. And so Psalm 70 is a good chapter to uh, compare with what uh, Habakkuk is saying here in this uh, prayer in chapter 3 of his book. It says, And the everlasting mountains were scattered, or they were broken, as again recorded in Psalm 78. The, the perpetual hills did bow. The mountains and hills that were from the beginning of, the, of creation that were settled upon their bases and uh, never moved, now trembled, shook, and bowed, as Sinai and others did, at the presence of God of Israel, again, Judges 5, Psalm 68, and verse 8, and also verse 16, as recorded in the scriptures for us, and things perhaps uh, Habakkuk was referring back to. His ways are everlasting. You know, when we, when we pray, you know, you know, we oftentimes use the, the, frames, the phrases, you know, God, you're, you know, you're everlasting from beginning to the very ending. And so, uh, again, Habakkuk, in, in this time of great, great trial, great turmoil, he is reminded of God of his great attributes. He says, his ways are everlasting. God's ways are everlasting. What he's done in ages past, he can do again. And his power, his wisdom, and his grace, they're unchangeable. Uh, and, and so uh, what he does at certain times, he can certainly take the, the same steps in, uh, in, the, in, in the next incident in his life. Is what he's hoping for and praying for according to counsels, purposes, and decrees in eternity. Then as we go on here uh, to verse 7, he says, I saw the tents of Cushan in affliction, the same as Cush or, or Ethiopia. The tents of, uh, of the Ethiopians, the same as the curtains of Midian. In the next clause, uh, tents be made of curtains, and the Ethiopians and, and Midians, Midianites, the same people. Uh, this seems to have, re to have respect to the panic 
which uh, seized the neighboring nations by whom the Israelites passed. When they passed by the uh, neighboring nations, they were, they were in panic, as well as the Canaanites in, in whose land they were marching. When they heard of the wonderful things and the powerful things that had been done in Egypt and at the Red Sea, and uh, as a witness, as, and, and, uh, and was, as, as was predicted by Moses in Exodus 15, uh, verses 14 and 15. And they became fearful of God's people and God's great mighty power. And again, as I've said in a number of times here in this uh, uh, lesson tonight, Habakkuk is just reminding God of how powerful he has been at, in the, at the eve of the captivity. And you and I perhaps would be, would be the, the same way. You know, if, if judgment was coming to America, we'd remind God of how, how good he has been to America and what he's done for America, all these many years of freedom that he's given to America. And we remind him you know, of his greatness and his glory and his presence. And so here's, a, here's the, the spirit in which uh, Habakkuk was praying this prayer on the eve of the captivity of the nation of Israel. He says, and the curtains of the land of, land of Midian did tremble. You know, when God moved powerfully in the time of Gideon and uh, used his 300 men, he started with, he started with 32,000 and God whittled down to 300 men. And uh, so again, Habakkuk is saying, you know, uh, look, God, when you moved, people trembled. They were afraid, but now they're not afraid. You know, they're not afraid. Uh, we're, we're being taken into captivity. You know, please show yourself true again is the spirit in which he's praying here. Now, verse 8 says, Was the Lord displeased against the rivers? Was thine anger, anger against the rivers? Again, referring to an incident in the Old Testament uh, in, in Egypt as the, he turned water into blood, uh, which was the, uh, part of the plagues of the land of Egypt in Exodus 7, verse 20. And when the punishment of the Lord uh, what was not so much against the, the children of Israel, but, but as against the Egyptians as a punishment for them for drowning the infants and Israelites in the land and in order to obtain the, uh, ob obtain the, the, the dismissal of his people from that land. So um, again, uh, Habakkuk is reminding God of the great things he did even when he parted the Red Sea and the seas were, uh, came upon the, uh, the nation of, uh, of Egypt, the Egyptians, if you will, and drowned them in the sea. And so he's just reminding God of his great power. Going, in the second part of verse 8, Was thy wrath against the sea, uh, that thou didst ride upon thine horses and thy chariots of salvation? You see the graphic there, the parting of the sea, meaning the Red Sea, of course, when the, sea, the strong east wind was sent and divided the waters of it, uh, which was for the benefit of the people of, of Israel, the children of Israel, and that they might pass through it as on dry land and for the destruction of Pharaoh and his host. Uh, who entered into this uh, this uh, dry land, if you will, with their horses and chariots, well, they were drowned. You know, when the seas came back over them, they were drowned and literally destroyed at that time. Now, in the verse 9, it says, uh, The bow was made quite naked. This refers to all the military weapons of warfare. The sword was unsheathed. All the military weapons were employed. The power of the Lord was exerted. The Lord was revealed in his power. So uh, the bow was made quite naked. In other words, it, it was used for a purpose there. And then according to the oaths of the tribe, uh, tribes, even the word, uh, thy, even, thy, even thy word, uh, Selah, that is to the f fulfill his word of promise, he had several times swore to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and to the fathers, uh, the fathers of, of the Israelites, that he would put them in possession of the land uh, of, the, of Canaan, of which he did. He promised those things, and he did. The word Selah, of course, is added as a, as a meaning or a pause to the power, uh, and, and to think about what God's mighty power had done. So the, the, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and the word Selah, uh, that pause, it refreshes. Uh, just think upon these things is what he's trying to say. Thou just cleave the earth with rivers. Uh, think about how God in the Old Testament uh, brought a water from the rock, the spite of the, of the rock, and these uh, waters gushed out and ran upon dry places like a river. Uh, channels and, and, and canals were made in the earth. And this, uh, this flowed uh, for the people of Israel and uh, followed the Israelites wherever they went, and God supplied them, uh, man and beast, with water. So again, Habakkuk is reminding God of his great power, his great care and love for the nation of Israel at, on the eve of the captivity. And as they were going to be in this uh, captivity for, for 70 years, uh, he's saying, you know, please, God, show your power again, is what he's trying to say. Now, this, uh, this will be our last verse for tonight, uh, verse 10. The mountains saw thee, and they trembled. It says, you know, at the presence of God, you know, as of Sinai of old, the Mount Sinai, which are signified by the, by the mighty people, nations, kings, and great men, 
uh, struck terror, an amazing providence of God in, in the world on behalf of his own people and against their enemies. So the mountains saw thee, and they trembled. In other words, they, the great and mighty men uh, of the world, those people that were against God, they saw God's mighty power, and they trembled, is what Habakkuk is trying to express here in verse 10. The overflowing of the water passed by. Again, as we think about uh, God's mighty power in the River Jordan, the time of passage of the nation of Israel, going into the Promised Land, when the water stood and rose up as a heap, and those below failed and were cut off and passed away uh, into the Salt Sea. And so uh, not only did God uh, cause the Red Sea to divide, but also as the uh, children of Israel crossed the Jordan River and they went through on dry ground also. So uh, Habakkuk is just reminding God of the great things he's done in the past and really asking uh, him to show his great and mighty power in this situation as they were in a, in, in a dilemma. You know, 70 years is a long time to be taken away from your land. And so this is a, a, a cry of desperation and a cry really of rem reminding God of what he has done and what he can do if, if, it, if it is his will. Well, we know that it was, it was God's will that God took the children of Israel back into the land of Babylon for 70 years, and he uh, corrected them and, and, uh, and helped them uh, along the way to understand who God was. And you know, sometimes in our life, we trust in our own selves, our own, uh, own uh, strength. We, we forget uh, who God is. We forget what he's done in the past. And sometimes we need to be reminded. So God help us live a, uh, a life close to the Lord every day. It says, the deep uttered his voice and lifted up his hands on high, signifying that the earth had praised God for his mighty power, such as when Jesus said, the rocks will cry out and praise God. So you see in, in the graphic here, uh, you know, praising Jesus today, that's what we should do as, as believers in Christ, uh, praise God today, because if we don't, the rocks will cry out. So we'll conclude tonight uh, with uh, verse 10 of, uh, of uh, Habakkuk chapter 3. And then next uh, Wednesday night, we'll conclude, we'll, we'll conclude the, the chapter beginning in verse 11. So let's have prayer uh, tonight. Lord, thank you for this uh, last chapter of the book of uh, Habakkuk, these 10 verses, the 10 first verses. Uh, Father, thank you for this man, uh, Habakkuk, and Lord, his, his concern and love for his people. Sometimes, Father, we're, we're just the same way as this prophet. We don't understand fully what you're doing. But Father, thank you for, a, even as we looked at this past Sunday in Romans chapter 8, verse 28, that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. Thank you, Father, for this. We pray your hand of blessing upon our lives as we continue to follow you and study your word. Thank you, Lord, for this book that we can look at, examine, and have as an example for our life today. We ask these things in Christ's name with thanksgiving. Amen.